in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Scott Dunlop, and welcome to session number nine of the Power Pixel Point training. And uh, within today's session, what we're going to do is now start getting into some of the nitty-gritty topics uh, with regards to the Pixel Point system. Some of the, the more uh, more substantial items within here. And the one we're going to uh, start it with today is actually inventory. Might as well get the get the big one out of the way. So with regards to inventory, first of all, for any salespeople who may be online, um, can Pixel Point do inventory? The answer is yes, quite obviously. Uh, we do have an inventory system built into the Pixel Point system. It's a simple inventory system. It's nothing overly complex, but certainly one that is quite sufficient for most establishments uh, around the world. Uh, that being said, um, let's take a look at a couple things you can do with it. First of all, as I kind of hinted into in yesterday's session, <clears throat> One thing that you can do in Pixel Point without upgrading to a professional license, without getting into uh, any of the, the real meat and potatoes of, of inventory, you can actually do a limited, simplified inventory, just fresh out of the box without having to do any form of upgrading on the POS system. To do that, all you have to do is go into inventory and stocked items. Now, I'm, I'm not going to cover all of this information right at this point, because what I want to do is just be very general about this. But in here, you go in and you create all of your different stock items or, or recipe items, I guess you might say. And in here, you uh, just create them all within this to the best of your ability. Now, in this, when it comes to calculating out as far as like your cost per unit, that's the price per piece that I have here, this field right at the bottom here is made available, which is price for box. And what this means is that you can put within there an ideal cost of what it is for a container of, of whatever it is. Now the box being the packaging. Okay, so for example, if I have chicken breast, let's say I'm not using the inventory system, I just want to set up a simplified inventory for my customer. Then what you can do is go in here and say, for example, chicken breast, okay, so I get them in a box that's typically uh, maybe about you know $20 a box or something like this. So in here you put in your description, you put in all of your uh, breakdown of descriptions as well, and over on the right, you can fill in this information. Now, as far as calculating out the cost per unit, it will not do that. Um, it, this is really intended to work in terms of the, your orders. When you actually place orders, it calculates out maybe an average or a last cost or something. We'll talk about that later. But what you can do right out of the box is just put in price for box. And what you're putting in here is just generally what is the price for a box of, of chicken breast, for example. <clears throat> and in doing that, you'll come up with a kind of a, a general cost per unit on this. It, it will calculate out all of your numbers for you on that. Um, also within here, just use a generic supplier if need be. Um, or if you want, you can set all this up for an easy migration into full-blown inventory later on if you wish. As far as anything else within here, don't worry about it. All you need to do is just set up your stock items. Having done that, the next thing you want to do is go into product setup within product setup, whatever the, the item happens to be, then you just go into the recipe tab, and in here, all those different stock items that you that you created on the system, you can then apply them appropriately within here and say how many units go into each one of these things. Now, from all of this information, first of all, you will have a list of all of your recipes uh, showing up within within these, these tabs here. Also, you identify the number of units, and the unit description will be carried across as well. The item cost, or cost per unit, will be based on what you had just put in within stock setup, though. So it will be a, you know, a close approximation. And from there, you can come up with a general recipe cost on this. So for example, if it cost me five cents for an egg and five cents for a strip of bacon and five cents for a slice of toast, and I throw them all together and it cost me 25 cents to make a bacon and egg breakfast, then that's what the system will calculate out for you here. So give you some basic recipe costing. And along with that as well, the system will track the usage of these on the system. Now, if you are using um, this this form of, uh, of inventory, then the next thing you want to do is you want to come over to Administrator, and you will go into System Setup, and come over to POS Reports. And within here, you've got all of your information. And as part of this, you can actually add in an additional report. In here, go into uh, your Pixel Reports. And in here, there is an inventory usage report. See that right there, end of day, inventory usage report. And what you can do is just add that into 
your end of day report. Now what will happen here is that after the system generates the conventional end of day report, it will also on top of that add in this additional report of inventory usage. And what it will do is tell the owner, for example, how many slices of bacon, how many eggs, how many slices of bread they used within the day. Now this will not tell them in terms of uh, what you have in stock or what your stock levels are because you're not even getting in, into inventory that deep. But what you are telling them is, here's what you're actually using out of your inventory. And for many places, that's good enough. You know, that all they need to know is just what kind of stuff am I using, and if it looks like I'm using a lot of something, then I'll go into my warehouse, I'll check it out, just make sure my supplies are okay on this, that's all. And, um, and so that's, that's kind of a simplified version of doing it. There's no additional upgrade on the system required, and once you have that information in there, it's set. You don't have to go back and keep filling around with data and updating things and so on like that. It's just a one-off. You, you create it, and that's it. So that's something to consider. Now, what we're going to do is we're going to actually turn on inventory, and we're going to get things working, and I'm going to explain how it all, all works. So the first thing we're going, to, we're going to do when we're setting up inventory is we go into System Setup, and in here we have a checkbox that says, Use Inventory Manager and in bracket Stockboy. Now, Stockboy is the name of the agent uh, that we have that's going to be running in the background. A system agent basically is a program that you set up a shortcut for in the Windows Startup folder. And so, when the whole uh, server starts up um, on the Pixel POS system, then it'll start up shortcut. It'll uh, for uh, SQL. It'll start start up the license manager, and then on top of that, you want it to start up the Stockboy agent as well, if you're going to use inventory, and have it just run in the background. It only has to start up once on the server, and that's it. So to do that, I'm just going to jump out of this for a moment, and I've actually created a shortcut on my desktop here of this particular program. Let me just uh, show you where it's, where it's located. Okay, so it's located within the Pixel POS folder, and it's an EXE called Pixel Stock Manager. .exe. So that is the program you want. Now what you're going to do is you're going to create a shortcut of this and you put it within the Windows Startup folder. That's down, uh, come down to All Programs, and then uh, we, we go into Windows Startup. Anyway, it's all in there. You can figure that out. Um, but in this, anyway, this is the program that you want to have running, uh, and it only has to run on the server. That's the only place it has to run when you start it up. It's an agent, so it just operates in the background. Now, in running it, I'm just going to double click on it here and get it running. And you'll notice down in my uh, taskbar, I now have this icon that shows up, a little box kind of disassembling itself, and it comes back together and disassembles itself. That is the Stockboy Inventory Manager agent. Now, if I double click on it, let's just take a look at what we've got in here. So this tells you that uh, it's actually working right now. If you want to, you can actually select on this box that says Hold Pro uh, Depletion Processing. Now, what this does, it pauses the depletion of inventory from your your stock uh, as things are ordered. So for example, if I order a sandwich with a peanut butter and jelly sandwich. So I've got my peanut butter, I've got my jelly, I've got my bread. And as I order each one of those peanut butter and jelly sandwiches, it depletes my inventory of those particular stock items. Now if I select on this, then what it will do is that will hold or pause the depletion of that inventory. Why would I want to do that? You would use this in a situation where you are doing a physical count on your inventory. You need to go in every so often and just double check between what the system reports and what is physically there in terms of your inventory. And when you do something like that, then you really need to kind of pause your depletion of inventory so that you can get your count. And what it will do is it will take that, that depletion, just kind of spool those numbers as it's going through, but it won't interfere with the, with the calculations going on there. After you've got your numbers, you've figured them all out, then you can go in, you make your adjustments, that's called the physical count, we'll take a look at that later on. And then from there, you unhold this, and then everything catches up from that point. Okay, so that's what it does. Now also, over on the right-hand side, we have setup. So let's just take a look at setup. Within here, there's a couple of ways you can handle your inventory in terms of how it's calculated. The first one, and the most common one, is average cost. Now what it means by average cost is that when you're calculating out what is the value of my inventory, then there's several ways that you can do it. Now let's say, for example, we have jars of olives in my, in my stock. Now typically for a jar of olives, it might cost me $3 for a big jar of olives. And from there, you, you count out all the olives. If you really needed to, you wouldn't really do that. But you can count out all your olives. And from there, if you've got, let's say, 50 olives in a jar, then 
your your cost per unit is one fiftieth of three dollars, whatever that calculates out to be. And so <clears throat> that's how it calculates your cost per unit. Now, as you order more jars of olives into your inventory, then you you need to take a look at okay, what is the value of my inventory? Well, basically, it's going to be an average cost, being it's the the average cost of all of the, what I've paid for all of these different jars because the prices may go up and down. It may be four dollars another day and two dollars another day. Who knows? And so the system will average all that out, and from there come up with an average cost of, of roughly what it what your value of uh, of olives is within the system. Now the second way of doing it <coughs> is last cost. Last cost means that whatever the last price is that I paid for olives, that's what the price is going to be for all of my olives. Now let's say for example we're in a situation where I've got my big supply of, of olives and starting to deplete down so I have to order more. And the world market of olives has crashed and so the value of olives is now skyrocketed through the roof. And so where it used to call, cost me $3 for a jar of olives, it might, might cost me $10 for a jar of olives now. And if that is the case, the value of all of my olives, including those I already have in stock, has now escalated up because it's based on the last cost. So if olives are now suddenly very expensive, then so are all the ones I have in stock. If I have it on average cost, then it will average out the expensive ones versus the cheaper ones and come, come up with kind of like a middle ground of that. I should point out as well that the average cost is a weighted average. This is the common terminology used for it. It's a weighted average inventory. In which case, then, it, it takes into account the, the quantity that I'm bringing in that's expensive and the quantity that I have in there already that is not so expensive when it's averaging it out. Underneath that, we also have disregard negative levels when receiving. <clears throat> now, what this means is that you can have kind of a bit of a skewing of the numbers when it comes to your cost per unit calculation based on your quantity. Okay, so for example, um, I sell hamburgers. And uh, within my establishment, I'm really getting low on hamburger buns. And so I placed in an order. And uh, so finally, the, the order comes in at the last minute. And I'm really busy. And I'm selling burgers as fast as I can. And I've used up all of my conventional inventory of buns. Now, I have this shipment of buns that just came in. But I haven't put it into my inventory yet. I haven't had time to sit down and do clickety-click to put the buns into my inventory. But they're sitting there on the, on the dock. So what I can do. I say, you know what, just run out there, rip open the box, saying, give me some buns, i gotta, I got to get these burgers out the door. And so what I'm do now, doing now is I'm selling more hamburgers that, use, that include within the recipe hamburger buns. And I'm selling more of them than I have actual buns in stock because the system doesn't know I have this shipment in there yet. So now I'm into a negative quantity of my hamburger buns. And when it comes to calculating out the, your inventory and your cost per unit and all this kind of stuff, well, now we've got this whole problem that's kind of occurred where I've got a negative quantity of hamburger buns uh, residing in my inventory. And so what you can do is have the system say, you know what, just disregard it as a negative value. Once you hit zero, just kind of hold it as, as zero. And even though you know, you're selling more buns than you've got, the system will actually hold on the on the uh, calculation uh, of, of uh, your inventory for that, <clears throat> and wait until you get your your quantities put back in when you actually put in your order for that later on. Coming underneath that, we have automatically resume stock, stock depletion after processing variance. Okay, so I just showed you how to hold your depletion of inventory. Well, in here, when you're pro doing your processing of, of variance, the variance between what the system calculates for your inventory and what you physically count for your inventory, then in here, the system, when you are finished processing that inventory, it knows that you're going to pause your inventory, do your count, and then as soon as you say process inventory and update all my numbers, then it will automatically resume the depletion of stock. Most places prefer to do this, but in some cases, they may not. They might, might want to say, well, just hold on that because quite often I'll process you know, some variance, but I haven't finished all of my counts yet, and so I just want to come back and do that. So if that is the case, you, you can determine from there uh, which way they prefer to do it. Use whole depletion date as the end date for the stock take. That's a mouthful there. Okay, now when it comes to doing a stock take, which is basically, you know, what have I got in inventory? You know, you're looking at all this stuff, and in some cases you're doing physical counts, in some cases you're just doing a evaluation of your inventory. In any case, Hold the depletion date, okay? So the depletion date being the last date of depletion, as the as the end date 
for the stock take. So when you're actually going in and doing a stock take, let's say, for example, you pause your inventory for two days while you're doing your inventory, then which day do you want to use as your stock take day? Will it be the beginning or the end of that date? So that, <laughs> that's a simplified version of explaining it. And so that's what that represents there. Now, with this running, all we need to do is just minimize it and leave it running in the background, and, and that will be fine as it is. What I'm going to do now is go back into back office, and we're going to carry on further from there. Okay, so here we are in the system. We have our agent running. What else do we need to do? So as I mentioned here, first of all, you go into System Setup, and you make sure that you've got Use Inventory Manager Stock Boy selected. Now, in doing this, what you're doing is opening up the interface between the Pixel POS system and the inventory agent that is running in the background. You need that interface open. You've got to have this selected to do that. A little word of caution, though. If you are not using the inventory system, then do not check this box. The reason being is that once you check this box, the system assumes that you've got the agent running, you're going to be seriously running the inventory system, and if so, it's going to start tracking the movement of stock items throughout the system as things are ordered, and it will be logging them uh, within, internally within the system. What you will find is that over a period of time, if you aren't using the inventory system but you have that checked, is that those logging of the logging of all those uh, stock movements will actually start to build up and accumulate as just unused records in the system. And maybe after a few months or after a year, you may find that you're running out of disk space. The reason being is that it's, it's building and building and not being used. In which case then, it's an easy fix. You just delete out all those those log files and then and then you're ready to go again. Uh, but just to, to prevent that, just to make sure that you don't check this box unless you're actually using the inventory manager system. All right, now having done that, let's come over to inventory and take a look at what we've got within here. So the first thing is stocked items. Now within stocked items, as you can see here, I've got chicken breast uh, up on the screen, for example. And in here, I have a description and then three levels of measurement that you can apply within here. Uh, that you have the unit description, and the unit description being one unit that you're going to apply to your recipes. This is the description that you will be applying whenever you create a anything involving a chicken breast, for example. The next thing here will be the container description. So your units may be provided in a jar or a box or a bag or something like that. And then underneath that, we have the package description, which is generally what it's shipped in. So you may get a crate or a pallet or something like that uh, that comes in. Now, when it comes to ordering, typically you would order by package, but you can also order by container and by unit as well, depending on the nature of the item that you're ordering. I'll show you how to go about doing that later on. We have these little three dot boxes as well, and if you select on any one of them, it will bring up a list of all of the conventional uh, descriptions that have been used up to this point. And you can use, reuse those existing descriptions, or you can just retype it in if you wish. The reason why we prefer to do this is that when it comes to things, let's say like ounce, for example, and depending if you've got two or three people who are entering your inventory information into the system, one person may use OZ. Uh, another may use OZ period, a capital OZ or a capital O, capital Z. Oh, I'm sorry, Z. <laughs> uh, a little Canadian there. And also, they may use the word, the entire word ounce as well. So there's a number of different ways that you can always describe these different things. And if you want some continuity between all of your different descriptors, then just uh, set it up once and then go look in here and make sure that it hasn't already been used in some other form. Coming over to the right-hand side, we have to assign it to a report category. <clears throat> it's a good idea that when you're dealing with things such as stock items, if you are going to be using inventory and so on, you might want to set up you know, two or three uh, report categories that would cover the uh, application of, uh, of your stock items rather than have to try and you know, fit them into other things because chicken breast could be used in hot items and cold items, for example, and maybe used in appetizers or main courses or grill items or, or 100 other things. So it's a good idea to just kind of create at least one report category that applies to your inventory stock items and just kind of group them all within there. Coming over to the right-hand side, as you put in your descriptions over on the left, they will be carried across to the right. You see here, piece per bag, how many units per container, bag per box, how many containers per package. And so you fill in the numbers for that as well. Underneath this, price per box, so this is where you would enter in your ideal cost. Now, if you have inventory manager running or the inventory system, like I just showed how to set that up, this box will be grayed out. 
The reason being is that it does not allow you to put in your ideal cost once you've got it up in the perpetual inventory up and running. Uh, what it will do is it will calculate your price per piece or cost per unit based on your orders. So if, for example, if you pay $10 for a box this week and $20 for a box next week and your average cost is $15 a box uh, for your, your chicken. So And it will calculate out your cost per unit that way. This edit button here allows you to make changes to price per or piece per bag and bag per box. Okay, now the only way that this will work is if you have zero items in stock. All right, quite often when people are setting up inventory, if I ask you off the top of your head, how many slices of bacon are in a pack? You get a shrug. If I ask you how many slices of bread are in a loaf, you get a shrug. And sometimes you might get how many eggs are in a dozen. <laughs> you might get a shrug on that too. In any case, if you ever put in the wrong numbers and you need to modify them a little bit, then you can use it, come back to the stock item, use this edit button, and you can change the numbers in here. The only stipulation is that you must have zero in stock. And the reason being is that if you don't have zero in stock and you make changes to those numbers, you're going to skew the calculation of your cost per unit. It, it will now be inaccurate as a result of that. And you don't want to do that. So once you put those numbers in, you save this record, then those numbers will be locked into place once you have more than zero in stock. So what we're doing right now is we're just creating the stock items. We're not actually putting them into, like putting a quantity of this item into the warehouse. That's done later on. Uh, but once we do that and you have them physically in there, then that's where those numbers will be locked into place. But if there's zero in stock, you can edit them using the edit button. Coming over to the right-hand side, we also have reference number as well. Now, the system will automatically assign a reference number to each of these stock items, uh, and you can utilize that. But if there is some form of reference number that they prefer to go with, by all means, you can go in and edit that number and just, just go in here and, and just change it to whatever it is you want and, and uh, go with that numbering system. Coming over to the left-hand side, we have several fields here as well. The first one is reorder level. You'll see it's in units. And also have par level in units. PAR has nothing to do with PAR technology. PAR stands, represents, for example, the ideal limit to bring it up to. And so when in here, we have our preferred minimum and our preferred maximum levels. And so in this, when I'm down to 200 pieces of chicken, the system is going to tell me, you are now low in stock. It's time to order more. And when I'm looking at it like, well, how many more pieces should I order? Then I look at the PAR level. And it tells me, OK, bring it up to a quantity of roughly 900 pieces. So this tells me if I order 10, 100, or 1,000 of these things. Underneath this, order by. So when you're creating a purchase order, and we'll get to that later on, then the system will automatically default to whichever description you put within here. So typically for uh, my chicken breasts, I order them by the box. So I can say order by box. And that will be the default description uh, descriptor that we'll use. Um, if you uh, need to change it within the purchase order to something else, by all means, you can do that as well. Coming over to the right-hand side, yield percent. Now, yield uh, represents how much of this item, that when, I, when I have it in my hand, how much of it am I actually using uh, when, I, when I apply it to a recipe. In some cases, you don't necessarily use the whole item, even though you paid for the whole item. An example of this would be like a head of lettuce or a head of cabbage, for example. There's the whole center core that you really don't use. So what you do is you cut all the, the leaves off from around that core, and then you dispose of the core. So in that case, it might be like a yield of 80 or 90%. Whereas for something like a chicken breast, for example, a yield of 100%, I use 100% of the, of the chicken breast. Coming down below that, auto order. Now, one of the features that Pixel Point Inventory offers is the ability to create an automated purchase order. What it will do is it will go into the system and it will say, well, okay, based on your current uh, quantities that you have right now, the current orders that you've got coming up, and, uh, and your, your date of depletion, I estimate that you are going to need this, 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 and this to be ordered uh, on a certain date. And that being said, then within here, if it calculates out, for example, that within my chicken breast, um, it says you should reorder 1.5 boxes of chicken. Uh, then there's a couple of ways you can handle it based on this field here. First of all, it can round up, which means if it calculates out 1.5, then it would round it up to 2. If it calculates out 1.5, it could round it down to 1. 
And if it calculates 1.5, you can allow partial. It means you can allow for fractional ordering of this as well and have that reside on the purchase order. And so that's what this will represent when you're creating an automated purchase order. It will either round it up, round it down, or leave it in the middle. Typically, in most establishments, they round up just to make sure they've got enough in there. On order, now you'll see here it says here 960 pieces. Now the reason being is that this is a field you do not edit. It will automatically populate itself if you have an outstanding purchase order. So when I'm taking a look at this and I'm creating my, my chicken breast, or I'm, I'm just looking at my chicken breast, breast record, and I can see within here, on order 960 pieces, that tells me that I have a shipment on the way. So I've already placed an order for chicken breast, and it's currently, it hasn't arrived yet, but it's currently on order, and I've got 960 pieces on the way. And then I can go into the inventory manager system and check out the uh, purchase orders uh, with regards to that. Coming down below that, we have supplier. Now within supplier, this is where you identify who is your supplier for your chicken breasts, for example. And in here, I've just selected ABC supplier. Now you'll notice it says ABC supplier primary. And along with this, I've got the ability to add in additional suppliers. So in this, of course, you can have multiple suppliers for any given stock item, which is very common as well. Because if ABC supplier is, is backlogged or he ran out of stock or whatever, he can't get his trucks out, uh, then I may need to resort to another supplier. And if that is the case, I want to make them available on here as well. To do that, just click on Add. I'll have all of my different suppliers in here. Just choose the preferred supplier, and they will also show up within there as well. And take a look as well. You'll notice that, that a lot of the supplier information shows up within here as well. It, it changes as you toggle back and forth between your suppliers in terms of who the contact is, the phone number for them, and also your account number with them. So that if at any time you need to call them up for anything, then I've got the chicken breast record up here. There's the supplier. I click on that supplier. There's the information I need. And I can call them up right away. Now along with this, we also have a couple other fields here. SKU, stock keeping unit. So within here, if there's a SKU number or like a, like a, like a lookup number, for example, then you can actually put that number within there, a reference number. Also within here we have barcode as well. So uh, one of the things you can do within the system is that you can run through when you're doing your physical accounts using a barcode scanner. I'll talk about that later on as well. But these barcodes can vary from one supplier to the next. So that's why you put in the UPC code for this stock item uh, within that field there, which is assigned specifically to that supplier and identified with that stock item. Okay, the next tab over we've got is advanced. Now within advanced, we've got all kinds of things pertaining to how it's managed within the system. The first thing here is stock depletion. What is the form of stock depletion? Anything food and beverage related will be by recipe. Okay, so what you're going to do here, this, this chicken breast, for example, is going to be applied to recipes. And as I order a chicken sandwich that has a chicken breast, then the recipe on that will call for two slices of bread and one piece of chicken breast, for example. And so uh, when you create this whole thing, everything will default to by recipe. But you can also do things by customer as well. Now if I select on by customer, that means that if I have 100 customers today, I have gone through maybe 100 or 200 or whatever of this particular item. Examples of this could be things like breath mints and, and toothpicks, for example. You know, If I provide these things on a per customer basis, uh, to, to the table, then I can, I can actually put those items in there as well, and I would deplete them by customer. Next one is by check. So this is an item where I put in, for example, uh, promotional items. You know, I may offer like a, a little gift card or a coupon to some local, local thing going on, or maybe a little keychain or something like that. So whenever I print off a check, then I provide one of these as well. And if that is the case, you can put this in here. You'll notice that with both customer and check, you have this field down here that says depletion units, and you put in as far as how many of these uh, on a per check or per customer basis. And the same applies to by day. So within by day, you may have things that you go through on a daily basis as well. A typical, ex a typical example of this is where you go to a restaurant, and you have a cup of coffee and a donut, and you're sitting down, and you're reading the paper. Well, the paper is provided by the establishment. You, you see this little rack, and you grab the morning paper, and you're reading it while you're having your coffee and donut. And if that is the case, you can actually have those newspapers put in here as well uh, and have them deplete on a daily basis, and they, they always change with each new day. 
We also have by employee shift as well. So these are things kind of like tools that are used and disposed of, disposable tools on a uh, on a per shift basis, such as maybe plastic aprons and and uh, hair nets and things like that, or rubber gloves, where they they may go through these things on a per shift basis. And so if that's the case, you can identify that within there. But the the vast majority of things will be by recipe. Right? Coming down below that, we have deplete when, and we have here exists in all warehouse. Okay, so in in this, you can identify as far as which particular warehouse you want to deplete from. Now, when it comes to the depletion of inventory, especially where a warehouse is concerned, if you can, keep it just to the one warehouse. There is one warehouse that's created by default, and that's the warehouse you work with for the establishment. And if you can, try to keep everything from, or pulling from that one warehouse. That will keep your inventory good and simple. But if you're into a situation where you're pulling from multiple warehouses, then you may have to elaborate a little bit in terms of how you're going to manage the depletion of your inventory. The reason being is that, let's say, for example, I've got an entertainment complex. And in here, I've got three bars. I've got a first floor bar, second floor bar, third floor bar. And each one of these bars has this great big refrigerator behind it. And it's got the big shelf unit with all the, co uh, the, the liquor uh, up above it as well. And in the bar refrigerator, I've got all my beer and things like that. Now, each one of those could be set up as their own separate warehouses. And so within station setup, I'll show you this shortly, you can actually identify in terms of which particular warehouse you are depleting from when you order something from it. So that being the case, then if I am on, at, on the first floor and I order a beer, then the beer will actually be depleted from warehouse number one. If I'm on the second floor and I order a beer, it'll be depleted from warehouse number two. And that's identified based on the station setup of those respective stations. That in itself is fine until someone says, all right, I also like to have a cheeseburger, please. Now, the cheeseburger is ordered from a separate warehouse, which is in the kitchen, for example. You may have a walk-in refrigerator or something like that uh, where you keep all of your food items. The problem is you can only assign one warehouse to a, a station. And so when it's pulling from a warehouse, it will be actually pulling from a bar warehouse, not from the food warehouse, in which case then you'll have discrepancies because then you'll be you'll have a quantity of negative 300 cheeseburgers at the end of the month, even though your liquor has all matched up properly. And so what, you'll ha and what you need to do is actually go in and do a an adjustment uh, within your, your warehouses on that. Now, that's all part of, again, the physical count, but there's also a multi-warehouse report in the back to help you with that to match things up. But without getting too complicated about it, as you can see, it can get a little hairy when it comes to working with multiple warehouses. So just kind of be aware that you may have to work with balancing all these warehouses at the end of the month. Sale type is all sale types. Okay, so within this as well, you can identify on a, on a per stock item basis as far as what particular sale types this thing pertains to as well. Because I may have, for example, two variations of chicken breasts, one designed for my takeout crew and one designed for my dining in crew, for example. And if that is the case, then you can make it sale type specific and have multiples of these particular chicken breasts. You know, because one may be bread and one may not be, for example. So if that is the case, you can uh, vary that on a per sale type basis. Coming over to the right hand side, is this item taxable for any of the following taxes? Okay, now this is where you can go about setting up all of your taxation uh, within here. It's really convenient because if you set it up within the individual stock item, then when you actually create the purchase order, that a lot of the taxation will already be taken care of for you just based on the items that you've applied within that, that particular uh, purchase order. And so in that, in that uh, for example, is this item taxable for any of the following? So this is where you apply which particular taxes apply to that chicken breast. So that when I order the supply of chicken breast, I know that I'm going to be paying state and federal tax for it. Now also within that as well, when you do purchase for it, is it included within the cost or not? Okay, so that's to be determined based on how the establishment wishes to manage and monitor its its uh, cost of inventory and so on. So that if I pay, you know, $4, uh, you know, for, for a pound of, of chicken and, and then there's another, you know, 50 cents on top of that for tax, then do I want that to be calculated as $4.50 or $4 plus 50 cents tax, in which case that will determine as far as the, the uh, calculation of your cost per unit. Coming over to the left, uh, no, I'm going to go, I've got that all done. Uh, coming over to the right-hand side, we've got a few things here. Weight of piece, tear weight of bag, employee price per piece. 
this makes no sense at all because with what we're working with here doesn't apply to this. But this all has to do with liquor weighing. Okay, I'm just going to save on what I've got here. Let's see if I've got some kind of alcoholic item. Vodka, good. Okay, so here we are with vodka. So I, what I've got, I'll just kind of give you some orientation on this. So I put in vodka, for example. I sell vodka at my establishment. The unit description is ounce because that's I use one ounce or two ounces or 1.5 ounces of vodka as I'm calculating my different cocktails and so on. Uh, the container would obviously be a bottle, and I order it by the case. Okay, here's uh, your minimum is uh, one bottle of 40 ounces, and you want it up to maybe a quantity of 10, 10 bottles, for example. Now, coming back over to advanced, you'll see within here I've got weight of an ounce, and I've got 0.2, tear weight of the bottle, 4.8 and the employee price per ounce is 0.19. Now, what these three fields have to do with is liquor weighing. And liquor weighing is a, is a means of which you monitor uh, how much inventory you've got within an open bottle of alcohol. Okay, so in this case, when I'm taking a look at um, a bar and I see a bottle of, of vodka there, and it may be two-thirds full, for example. I can actually use this form of technology here to go about telling me how much alcohol is physically in that bottle. And this is a, a way of, of monitoring your inventory uh, of all of your liquor as, uh, as you go through on a nightly basis. Because this is very common where bartenders will have to weigh each bottle at the end of the night. And so what you do here when you're first setting this up is as follows. Let's say this is a vodka, uh, a vodka vodka Smirnoff, okay? So I've got a bottle of Smirnoff sitting there, and this is a full bottle of vodka Smirnoff. I put it on the weight scale, and there's the weight of the whole thing. That's the full bottle plus the uh, the weight of, of the glass as well, the, the, the weight of the bottle. Now, I also take an empty bottle of, of Smirnoff uh, with the cap on, and I put that on there as well, and uh, I weigh that. Now, that is the weight of the bottle by itself. Okay. Now, the difference between the two is the weight of the vodka that goes inside it. And then if it's a 40-ounce bottle, you divide that by 40, and there is the weight of, of one ounce of that vodka. And that's what you put within here when you're setting up your weight per ounce. And quite often, actually, rather than have to physically do that, you can actually get online, and there's, there's websites out there that actually tell you in terms of what is the weight of a bottle, of a full bottle, an empty bottle of, let's say, Smirnoff, for example, and what is the weight of an ounce. And that will just save you a lot of time. Just go in, and you can actually put that information in there, just co copy it off there. But um, when you do go about doing weighing, liquor weighing and so on, the system will actually keep track of this for you as well. So you've got the weight of the ounce, the weight of the bottle, and then we have employee price per ounce. Now on this, let's say, for example, I'm Scott the bartender, and I'm trying to show off how fancy of a bartender I am. And so I'm slinging bottles around and doing acrobatics and so on, and I'm slopping liquor left, right, and center. Well, that's profit that's going out the door because, you know, I'm just for my own carelessness, uh, I'm, I'm spilling liquor all over the place. And so what the establishment may say is, you know what, Scott, I'm going to start charging you for uh, all that liquor that you're, you're losing. So basically, whatever the discrepancy is within uh, my weights of the vodka, for example, then I'm going to charge you 19 cents per ounce. Uh, for this. And so that means at the end of the, the night, they'll generate this report and say, okay, Scott, you owe me $3.29 uh, for you know, all the liquor that you spilt all over the place. So that will also give me some, some incentive to make sure that I don't spill that <laughs> anymore. Uh, but there is a report in the back that allows you to actually do that. And so that's what these three fields are for, is basically liquor weighing. Now we also have some fields here, prep location and prep days. These have to do with something a little bit different, and that is um, catering establishments. So in this, if I have not so much for vodka, but let's kind of go back to our chicken breast again. So here we are with chicken breast, and I'm going to use my chicken breast. They're going to be used in chicken salad sandwiches. Okay, So I get an order in for 200 chicken salad sandwiches for Friday uh, that I need to make. So in here, first of all, prep locations. So in this, I can identify which prep station these are going to go to. So when I generate my catering reports, it will say, okay, you need, you have an order of 600 or 200 chicken salad sandwiches, so you need uh, 200 chicken breasts and, uh, you know, four gallons of mayonnaise and, and a bunch of salt and pepper. And so all that stuff will be allocated to prep station number one. So when you're generating the reports, it'll, it'll be identified to that proper location. We also have prep days. 
Now in here, I may need to put in something greater than one or greater than zero. The reason being is that when I store my chicken breasts, they're normally uh, stored in big bags, for example, and they're in my freezer. Now if I get an order that comes in and says, okay, I need you know, 200 chicken salad sandwiches, then the system needs to know, okay, so you're going to need chicken breasts, but you can't just pull them out of the freezer and start making chicken salad sandwiches. You need to actually let them thaw out. So in here, you put in prep days. How long will it take me to use this uh, chicken breast from the way it's stored to the finished product? And so within here, you may put in two days. So day one will be you take the chicken out of the freezer. Day two, you make the chicken salad. And so this will affect in terms of, of the timing of when those reports are generated. Because when I do say, for example, I've got an order for 200 chicken salad sandwiches on Friday, then that means on Wednesday, the chicken breasts need to be pulled out. No, on Thursday, the chicken breasts need to be pulled out so that I can make them first thing on Friday and have them fresh and ready to go uh, for the delivery. Coming down below that, location and level in warehouses. Now, if you are, once again, working with multiple warehouses, you can actually identify on a per warehouse basis how much you've got in stock within each one of these. And so within this, you identify that, uh, let's go back to bars one, two, and three with my vodka, for example. Um, here, I'll just save on that and go there. So here I am within my vodka, and in this, what I can do then is identify if I have multiple warehouses, uh, you know, warehouse number one, uh, I've got you know three bottles. Warehouse number two, I got six bottles. Warehouse number three, I got four bottles. And this will help with a function that we'll take a look at later on, which is referred to as warehouse transfers, where you can transfer stock between different warehouses. So if I'm the bartender on on floor number one, I can call up the guy who's handling the bar on floor number three and say, I see that you've got you know four bottles of vodka to spare. Can I have one of them because I'm I'm almost out? And so we can set up a warehouse transfer for that. The next tab over is sub-recipe. Now, within my inventory here, I have something called potato salad. Let's take a look at this. Okay, It's activated just by selecting on that uh, has recipe uh, little checkbox there. Now, in this, you will come up with this screen, and it will allow you to put in recipe items that pertain to this recipe item. So, uh, for example, the potato salad is something I make in-house. Okay, This is a stock item that I put in some of my dishes. So if you order the meatloaf or the chicken breast dinner or something like that, it will include maybe two ounces or four ounces of Scott's world famous potato salad that I make in the restaurant. And this is quite common for sauces and things like that as well. So what you're doing is you're pulling raw ingredients from your inventory, such as potato and mayonnaise in this example, and you're cooking them into something to make another stock item. Uh, and then putting that, that inventory back in, which in this case is potato salad. Now we have a process set up with Inventory Manager that does all this depletion and re, re inputting of inventory uh, for, uh, for sub recipes of this nature. But what you can do is within here, this is where you identify as far as what are the raw ingredients that are go, going to go into it. So in this case, for my potato salad, um, see, I'll just kind of orient you again here. Potato salad, I sell it by the ounce, uh, I create it in a bowl, and I make a batch of it. And the supplier is in-house. This is something I make in-house. Okay, coming over here, it's still applied by recipe. And then within sub-recipe, I say that in this, uh, potato salad is potatoes and mayonnaise. And to add more items, just click on plus set inventory item, and you'll have all the additional stock items within there. Now, Having applied all of those, then you'll come up with what your total recipe uh, cost is on this. Okay, I haven't got all this set up on here. But also off to the right-hand side, we have this thing that says recipe type is. We have batch and nested. Now, a batch recipe is where I physically make this. Okay, so I'm going to make a batch of Scott's world-famous potato salad. So I get out my big tin bowls, and I pull my inventory from the shelves, and I throw them into the bowls, I mix them up, Boom, here's my new thing, and then I put that into a refrigerator, and that's my new stock item that's in there. That's a, that's a batch recipe. Now, a nested recipe is something a little bit different. This is now, instead of just, we'll, we'll say that my restaurant is now Scott's Hamburger Emporium, okay? And on this, I have 42 flavors of hamburgers that I make, okay? And it'll be all different toppings and stuff like that. Now, all of my hamburgers... Uh, have their own recipes. I have the Canadian burger, the New Orleans burger, and the the Chicago big beef burger, and, and whatever else. 
And each one of these has their own recipe. But within it, they're all working with the same base ingredient, which is uh, a basic burger. So if that is the case, then I can create a nested recipe of a basic burger being a hamburger and a patty, okay, or a hamburger bun and a patty. And from there, I've got all my variations from it. So rather than have to recreate those specific items uh, for my basic burger and then applying in all the other ingredients and so on, I can create a nested recipe item called basic burger. And then from there, I use the basic burger within all the other recipes. So then I would have basic burger plus Swiss cheese and mushrooms for one, and basic burger with hot, pellet, hot peppers and, and chilies on another. And so that's how you create a nested recipe and just saves you having to re-enter all that over and over. The example I used of a basic burger, you probably wouldn't do it for that because it's just two stock items. But if there was any special ingredients and flavors and herbs and spices that I put into it and so on, that could get a little lengthy. So that's where you would want to use a nested recipe in that case. How to make. So within here, you can now put in some how to make information on this because I am now Scott the prep guy who has never boiled water in my life and I'm told to make 200 chicken salad sandwiches. So if that is the case, then I may need to know, well, what do I, what do, I do and how do I make it look? So within here, first of all, you can have an image of the stock items. So this is what it should look like by the time you're done. It's something like this. And along with that, you have the how to make instructions on here. So you, it may say, for example, you know, pull out the chicken breast, let them thaw out, chop them up, and then cook them and mix them into something else and so on. And, and all that information will go within here. So this way, if I'm a complete newbie, I've got instructions here on how to make it. I know what it looks like as well. And user-definable fields as well. You can create these if need be. Uh, once again, you activate user-definable through policies. And within policies, you have this thing here for show user-definable fields. And in this, I've just created a couple, one called food color, one called temperature. And from this, you can just do whatever you, you want to do. OK, and so that is all the settings in there for creating a stock item. Now, in this, you'll notice that when you save the, the record, you've created a new record, then you will have this uh, button here made available called Create Recipe Item. Now, you can use this or you don't have to use it. Uh, you would use this in situations where you need to use it in post-inventory usage. Okay, now let's think back for a moment. I was talking about post-inventory usage is one of the function buttons in the function menu within a transaction uh, at the front end. And I had indicated here that you use post-inventory usage when you want to do a manual depletion of your inventory from the front end. Specifically, for example, when you're working with a buffet. Okay, so I've got an all-you-can-eat buffet. At the end of the night, I go to the chef and say, Chef, what did you use in this buffet? And he says, I used three bowls of Scott's World Famous Potato Salad and two heads of lettuce and 16 pounds of cheese and four pounds of cold cuts and 32 eggs and so on and so on. So he tells you, you know, gives you maybe a list of everything that was used within the buffet. And since there is no set recipe to a buffet because everyone's plate is different every time they go up, then you need something like this where you're going to say, okay, this is what was used in it. And so from there, then in the front end, you go in and you, you would create, uh, create a, an empty check. And on there, you would post all of those, those items. Now, the thing is, you're not actually looking at the list of all these different stock items that are within here because the system just doesn't recognize that. What it does recognize is products. You order products on, on the system. So what you want to do is make sure that uh, for any item that you create that you want to make available for that, you actually create a corresponding product uh, item within the product setup screen using the uh, type of product of recipe. Remember I talked about recipe item? So this is basically just a little macro button. And what it will do is it will automatically create that recipe item for you. All you have to do is just click on it, and that's it. It's done. Now, what has just been created? Well, let's take a look. Let's go over to Products, Product Setup. And within here, I might have to scroll down. There we go. 99 equals egg, 99 equals potato salad. So here is the item that was just created when I clicked on that button. 
On this, it creates an item. It says 99 equals. Okay, so that will tell you right off the bat, first of all, that this particular item is a recipe item that was created automatically through that function. The second thing it does is that it clumps all of these different items together so that when you're taking a master a look at the master list of all of your products in the system, everything that begins with 99 equals, you know, is a stock item. And the system also uses this as well as its filter when it goes into the post inventory usage function, it actually looks for that as well. Take a look at the type of product, recipe item. So this is all you need, is just the description and the, uh, the uh, indicator that it's a recipe item. It will need to assign it to a report category, which it takes a look at within product setup, and then also, or within stock item setup, I should say. And then also within here as well, it will make sure that it's assigned a value of zero dollars as well. Because in doing that, when you go into post inventory usage, you don't want these items uh, actually assigned with a dollar value. And then in there you just go in, you select on the items, you close it off to zero dollars cash, and then your inventory is brought in line. You've done a manual depletion of your inventory from the front end to accommodate that. All right, the next thing down is supplier setup. So within supplier setup, this is where you set up the basic information for all of your different suppliers. Now the information is pretty basic in terms of the name of the company, the address, the contact, and some phone numbers and email as well. Over on the right hand side, you can also put in your account number that you have with them, and that information will show up within the inventory system. Also your payment terms as well. Uh, so in here I've got COD, if I don't have other ones in here, but you can put in like a net 30, 16, 90, that kind of thing. Also ship via, and if there's any different methods of how it's, uh, it's delivered, then we have our shipping information in here as well, and you can use conventional ones to, for that. Over on the advanced tab, you can also identify on a per supplier basis what taxes they may be exempt from, especially if your suppliers are coming in from a different state, then the taxes may be a little bit different uh, based on that particular supplier because maybe he's coming in from Illinois and, and you're in Indiana or something like that. Uh, so you can uh, identify as far as uh, the exemption of taxes in certain cases. Also, show linked inventory items as well. This identifies what items are linked to that particular supplier right now if you're going in and modifying this. As we go further into it, you're going to be actually assigning these to it, and I'll show you how to go about doing that. And then finally, we got warehouse setup. So within warehouse setup, this is where you can set up multiple warehouses again. So we have one that's set up uh, by default, which is the warehouse general. On here, you can assign it some kind of a reference number for reporting purposes. And then you have the main contact for that warehouse, if, if applicable. And uh, it may be off-site as well. So if that is the case, you could have uh, an address and a phone number and things like that. Take a look down here. Copy address from the company info tab. All right, company info tab is what you have set up initially within uh, administrator setup system, and then there's a tab within there called company info, and you put in the address of the establishment. And if you just want to pull that in because the, the warehouse is located within uh, my establishment, just click on that and it will populate these fields for you. All right, the next thing we've got is inventory. This is the actual inventory manager system uh, that you would use for the pixel point system. And so in here now, what we're going to do is just walk through these various uh, applications that we've got within here, and I'll explain each one of them. The first thing we've got are all these pull-down menus across the top. And as you can see within here, anything that you've got within the blue bar will also be available within any of these as well. Now, along with this, we have things such as options when you're setting up um, your inventory. So for example, allow for back orders, yes or, yes or no, when it comes to your purchase orders. They may have things on back order. Do you want to keep the purchase order open or do you want to need to close it off anyway? Auto receive purchase order. Do you want to have that allowed on there so that you've got, um, when your inventory comes in, automatically receive it into the system or pause it and I have to actually physically receive it myself after I go through and inspect it and make sure it's all good. Uh, only show supplier items. No or yes, okay? So within here, this has to do with the items that are specific to the supplier. Um, if, for example, I, I have pickles and I normally don't get pickles from ABC company, then I may or may not want to have that show up uh, within the potential list. Uh, I only want the things that are unique to that particular supplier when, I'm, when I identify that supplier on the purchase order. Calculate suggested ordering quantity. 
yes or no. So again, this is whether you, the system will be intuitive enough to do this or not. Uh, then you can identify that, or you can just leave it as it is, in which case then you have to physically uh, put in that number yourself. Pause inventory depletion, you can do it from here as well. There's several areas you can do it from. And then we've got purchase orders with all of our different things here, and we'll take a look at those shortly. They're all down here. We also have stock as well. So within here, we've got stock levels, physical counts, and transfers, and so on. Again, all this stuff is identified within here. You may find on yours that add batch recipe and add spillage and waste, which I have over, over here, these may not show up on yours. And if that is the case, it's just a matter of adding them in because they're, they're newer functions or, or occasionally used functions. So to do that, just go to your, your blue bar, and just like within back office, right-click, customize toolbar, and then from there, just go down to the items that you want and just drag those two items up into here. Within window, show active records only and help, and then programs not applicable here. So you've got all of these different things. Now, coming across the main taskbar here, as I said, you can add in those additional ones. And we've also got things such as new purchase order, create a new purchase order, and that purchase order then goes to your supplier and says, this is what I want. Uh, we also have receive and cancel purchase orders as well. Input new stock. You use this when you're creating your initial inventory on the system. So what you do is you create the stock items, and then you go into input new stock, and this is where you're putting quantities, applying quantities to those stock items. Stock levels, just to take a look at what your levels are. Your physical counts to compare what you've actually got versus what the system says you have. Transfers between one warehouse and another. Stock supplier setup, if you select on this, it's the supplier setup, just like we took a look at earlier on. It's just available within here as well. Auto purchase order, this will create an automated purchase order for you. And recipe setup. And this recipe setup is similar to the one that's used within product setup, only it's a little more comprehensive. What you can do is you just select on whatever the item happens to be, and then from here you can identify which stock items go into that. So you're setting up the recipe within here. And this information is carried across to product setup within the recipe tab. It just offers you a little more comprehensive information. Then adds spillage and waste and add batch. Now coming down below that, we have Ask Inventory Manager. And this is where it will show you all of the outstanding purchase orders or closed purchase orders or warehouse transfers that reside within the system. So in here, for example, show active and back order purchase orders of type, orders, or transfers being warehouse transfers. Orders for, and then you can choose a specific supplier and a specific date. And if you're looking for a specific purchase order and you know what the number is, just select on that and punch it in. And then from here, you should be able to come up with all kinds of stuff. Okay, I really don't have anything in here because I haven't been using it. Uh, but within here, you'll have a list of all of your different purchase orders or warehouse transfers that reside on the system. You select on one, you can double click on it, uh, and it will retrieve it up, or you can select on it and then receive PO or, or whatever you want to do with this. All right, so what we're going to do right now, we've, we've got some stock items in there, but we really haven't created much of anything else. So the first thing we're going to do is input new stock. So I'm going to select on this, and it's going to come up with this form. Now, the nice thing about this is that we really don't use a lot of different screens for doing, doing things in here. If we can keep it as uniform as possible, by all means, we'll do that and just make it simple. And so what you're looking at here is basically a purchase order. And the only diff difference is that this particular purchase order will put inventory into it, the, the system right away. So the way you do it is as follows. You come into the site and they say, OK, I want to do my inventory. So the first thing you need is a list of all of their recipe items. You need also a list of all their suppliers. And you need them to go through their warehouse and give you a physical count of what they physically have in their, their establishment at this time for each one of these stock items. The next thing you want to do is, after you've created the stock items on the system, is start applying some quantities to it. So in here, we say, for example, ABC supplier. I'll choose them. And there's all their information populating within here. Warehouse 2, so in this case, I'll say Warehouse General that this is going to go to. There's where it all goes to. And within here, we also have information over on the right-hand side in terms of when you need to receive it and so on like that. Uh, this is used in conventional purchase order, but otherwise it will be for immediate time in this particular application. Coming down below that, we can add on our inventory items. 
And within here, it will bring up a list of all of the items that pertain to that supplier. That's what that setting was, is that just show me the things that are unique to the supplier. If you do need to override this because now ABC supplier now carries pickles, then I can select on show all uh, items from all suppliers, in which case then pickles will show up and I can actually select pickles and have that added to this purchase order. And from this point on, they'll be added into this list as well. Now in this case, I'm going to order some eggs. So I'm going to select on egg and OK. So there is eggs that I'm ordering right now. And so in this, uh, it shows the reference code for that. The next thing we have is the description of egg on order. So within here right now, how many do I want to order and receive? All right, so it's pulling it from past orders here. But on this, if you select on many of these fields, you'll come up with a three-dot box. And what it will do is allow you to make changes to it. So I'm going to say, for example, five. So ordered five, received five, for example, five crates. And, and remember, this is the initial one that, like, this is what you currently got, and you're going to put this directly into your inventory. Right? And with this as well, I may not want it all in, in uh, units of crate. So if I select on this, I can change to any one of those levels of measurement when I'm applying this. The next thing over here is my cost each. Okay, so what does it cost me per crate of eggs? So in this, I'm going to say, for example, uh, it's going to be uh, $5. And so from there, I've got five crates of eggs. It's going to cost me a total of $25. Uh, if there is any uh, taxes that I need to apply, then I can select on those as well. They will populate down here accordingly. And uh, along with that as well, what is the status? Uh, it's active or it can be on back order or something like that. That's all handled on a conventional purchase order. In this case, they're default of active because this, this is going directly into it. With all this information in here, and if there's any additional things you need to add in, you can do that as well. Um, on a conventional purchase order, you can also put in a comment down here as well. And then from here, print to, in which case then you can preview it up on the screen. You can send it to a printer. And you can also uh, send it out uh, via like a PDF or an HTML or something like that and have it emailed out. Uh, in a kind of like a file format. In this case, actually, I'll just show you a preview. So there's what a purchase order looks like on the Pixel Point system when you print one out. It would show up something like that. Okay, and so closing on that, but we're going to put this directly into our inventory. So we take all this and we select on Receive Purchase Order. Process in inventory. Now, if I say no, it'll save it as a purchase order within the system. But in this case, I'm going to say yes, and you would do it most times uh, for this particular function which case then that is now put directly into the system and now I have a supply of eggs actually in my inventory. Now coming over to, um, here let's do new purchase order. I'm creating, going to create a new purchase order for and I'm going to order something from a supplier. This is not something I have in stock right now. So on this I select on my supplier, I'll say it's this supplier and on this there's all my information and I can identify in here as far as when I, what date and time that I, I really need it for. And then coming down below that, I have a list of all my stuff. So I'm going to order some potatoes uh, from XYZ supplier. How many crates? I'm going to say two crates. So there's two crates. What is the cost each on those? Now, in this, if I select on the three-dot box, it will actually go in and bring up a history of what I've paid for these, these potatoes. And you can pull up from that if you wish. Um, or it will, all, if nothing else, it will show you, hey, the price has gone up suddenly. What happened here? Uh, but in this case, I don't have any. So I'm going to say, for example, $5 uh, per, per crate of potatoes. And again, I can do all my taxes and stuff like that. And with all this done, then I can print it off or I can send it as a, as a, as a file in an email. And also I can select on Save PO. Okay, so here's the closed PO, which is the one I put directly into the warehouse, and then here's the active one, which is an outstanding purchase order that I have on the system. So that's how you go about creating it. When you're ready to actually use it, you select on it, and notice now I've got receive PO, cancel PO. If you select on receive PO, then it'll just bring it up on the screen. You can make any last minute changes, because maybe, for example, uh, you, as far as you ordered two, but you've got maybe one on back order, for example, or maybe one fell off the truck or something like that. So you can change around as far as you know, the difference between how many were received and, and how many were actually ordered. <clears throat> and
And uh, actually, I'm going to hold it right there. Okay, so we got our purchase orders in handled now. And what we're going to do from this point on, we're going to carry on from stock levels and kind of carry across. But at this time, uh, we're coming up roughly on five minutes after two. My voice is starting to get a little rough, so I think what we'll do is we'll take a five-minute break. I'll let you get up and stretch and so on. And I'll see you back at uh, 10 minutes after two, my local time. Thanks.
Okay, we're back. If everyone wants to get seated. Okay, so where we finished off before the break is that we had gone through and we've uh, worked with the purchase orders and also created new stock as well, which is basically a purchase order to put your inventory directly uh, into your, your, uh, your stock levels. So now what we're going to do is we're going to take a look at this one called stock levels. Now what this does, it actually goes in and takes a look at uh, what you currently have in stock within any given warehouse. So you'll see within here I can isolate on a specific warehouse or I can just choose all warehouses and gives me my, my grand total of all of these different things. Along with this as well, you can specify things down by report category as well. So if you are breaking down your inventory by, let's say, liquor-related versus food-related uh, stock items, then you can uh, kind of do that as well. Uh, over to the right of that, we also have uh, some calculations that it will provide in terms of your general cost per unit, the, the uh, value of your inventory as well, and your total inventory value where it tallies all of that up. And this is where that calculation of the weighted average or the last cost uh, comes into effect. It can be very useful when taking a look at that. Physical counts. Okay, so I've gone into stock levels. I've taken a look and it says I have five crates of eggs in there. Uh, totaling 1,440 eggs in total. And on there, you know, I'm not too sure if that's really accurate or not. It's about time that I actually did a, a physical count. So what I can do then is I can actually go into the house, the, the warehouse, and do a physical count on this. Now, when it comes to doing physical counts for inventory, uh, there's a few things that uh, are available to you here. First of all, physical counts. I go into this, and let's just take a look at this screen for a moment. So it shows me... Um, the item in here, for example, egg in my warehouse, and in here I've got these fields for crate, carton, and egg. And so, and then what I can do here is actually I can fill in those numbers, what I'm actually counting in this, and uh, from there, when I'm finished all this, I can select on process variance. And what this will do then is compare that to what the system has calculated is in there. Now, if I come to this area here that says show system and click on that, it will now show me what's in there versus what I'm counting, okay? So I can actually stretch this out a little bit to help out. And so in this, uh, for my egg, it shows right now five crates, no cartons, no eggs, no individual eggs. And in here, I'm actually going to put in my variance here so I can take a look at side by side. I'm going to say there's uh, four crates and one carton and three eggs, okay? So I have a discrepancy of 261 eggs that has suddenly disappeared on the system, and for whatever reason, I can, I can look it up, or I can write it off, or I can do a recount, or whatever the case. But when you uh, are going through and, and doing these physical counts, this is where you go about putting in that information. And at this point, I can just kind of save where it is without processing the difference, and I can do another counter or whatever. Or I can just say process variance, and from this point, it will then update the levels that I have within there to tell me that I no longer have five crates, I've got four crates and a whole bunch of eggs uh, on top of that. And so that's how it goes about, about doing all this information, uh, is, is when, when you want to get a, an accurate count in terms of what you've got within your stock levels. Now, having done that now, if I go into my stock levels, it now shows that I have four crates, one carton, and three eggs uh, currently in stock. Okay, so I have an accurate count on that. How do you go about doing the physical count itself? Well, there's a couple things you can do within the system. Uh, one thing, actually, I'm not going to jump out to do it, but there's actually a stock take uh, report that you can generate within Report Viewer and also within Data Miner as well, which are the two reporting systems. Um, and I'll show you, you know, when we get get to reports in another session. But anyway, there's a report that's in there that basically will give you a list of all of the different stock items that reside within that warehouse. And from there, what you can do is just print it off, and it'll have all the columns for for things such as the crate, the what the unit, the container, and the package. You'll have the three columns for that. And you just snap it onto a clipboard, you walk in, and you just fill in the gaps on that. So the system will allow you to do that. Also, uh, within here as well, when you take a look at um, your stock levels, you notice here we've got move up and down. When you generate that report, it will pull from this listing as it shows up within here. Now, what you can do is actually you can modify the location of any of these items within this list. So for example, I may want my eggs further down the list where I've actually, they, they show up if I was to start at the front of the warehouse and work my way to the back or from the left and work my way to the right. 
So I may have, for example, all my dry goods, and then I've got all my wet goods, and then I've got all my cold goods, and whatever, whatever. And you can group them all that way and have them in the list that, like this, so that you're not scattering all over the list when you print it out. You can actually start at the left, work to the right, and start at the top of your list and work your way down, and the two match up. So that's important to know as well. Also, another thing you can do is there's actually a front-end application that you can run for doing the physical count as well, rather than have to do it from the back within here and use a manual entry process. Okay, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to jump out of this for a moment and exit out of here and take a look. I've got this shortcut that I've actually created on my, my desktop, and you can have this available on a, on a station, and actually you can set it up on a PDA as well. And I'm just going to show you the shortcut for this. It's called pixelinventorycounts.exe, residing within the Pixel POS folder. What does this thing do? Well, if we run it, first of all, it will ask if you want to pause your inventory depletion because you're going to go in and do a physical count on it. Nine times out of ten, you're going to say yes to this, so we'll just say okay. Now, from here, what it will do is it will bring up that list of all the stuff that resides within the warehouse. As you can see within here, I've got um, my warehouse general. And on this, I can, I can isolate as far as which particular warehouse I want to be on. I can also isolate on specific report categories and on weighted items only, which is really great for liquor, because that means you can use this application within the front end for liquor weighing. You can just select on that, and you'll, you'll have all your items in here for that. But let's go all warehouses. Oh, select warehouse, warehouse general. All right, where did I put it? I just lost my, whoop, lost my thing. Oh, I know what I'm doing here. All items. All warehouses. There we go. Okay, so getting back to this, I should have deviated on that. So in this, I've got my egg that's showing up in the general warehouse, and I'm going to actually go in and, uh, and uh, do a physical count on it. So in this case, then, I can actually do it right from the screen here. And you'll see within this, I can resume depletion. So it's pause depletion. I can resume it right from the screen, process the variance. So I put in my numbers for these things, and then I can do that. To actually put in the numbers themselves, you use enter counts. So you select on the given item, and then enter counts. And on this, it comes up with a whole screen interface for this. And on this, then I can say, for example, I've got four crates and one carton and five eggs. Okay. And so then I've got all my information in here. And you can use these as well for using the keypads because this is designed for touch screen as well, you know, in case you're not working with a key keyboard like I am. And then from there, after putting in all this information, I can click on uh, next item because there may be multiple items within that warehouse or just OK. And then I've got my, my thing in there, and it shows my variance of two eggs in this case. And then having done that, then process variance. Are you sure? Yes. Okay, it's now going in. It's doing a new stock take. And done. So now that's all been updated. So this is a nice uh, user interface that you can actually apply. And you can put this directly into the front end. Remember how to do that? You go into the functions, uh, the function men menu manager. <laughs> that's within the administrator pull down menu. And you can actually apply this, this as an external program into the front end and put it in maybe within the manager function menu or something. All right, coming back into back office. Here, just to kind of identify, what I was trying to trip over my tongue with was POS function setup. And so within here, you can go into this, and maybe within you know the, the manager function menu, for example, I can go into this, and new function, and then from here, run program, and then you can browse for that program and just put it in there. And it will be available within the front end. All right, coming back into inventory. All right, so within here now, we've uh, gone in and uh, done a physical count. So now let's go into transfers, transfers where you're transferring from one warehouse to another. So in here, I can say, for example, transfer from my bar warehouse to my uh, general warehouse. And in, well, actually, I don't know if i got anything in here. Probably not. Maybe I should try it the other way around. Okay. So in here, I'm going to transfer some eggs from one warehouse to another. So on this, I'll select on that. How many crates? Um, I'll say on here, maybe one. All right, so I'm going to transfer one crate of eggs from this warehouse to that warehouse. 
Right. And having done that, I can now save the transfer. Here, let's just uh, preview the transfer as well. You'll see that it looks much more like a purchase order. And within here, it just identifies that this is a warehouse transfer and what it is I'm transferring from this warehouse to that warehouse. Process and inventory. If I say no, then it will wait and I can do that later on, or I can say yes and do it now. Actually, I'll say no. Uh, and the cancel. No, I don't want to cancel. Maybe I do want to. No, I didn't take it because I didn't do that right. All right, you can pretty well figure out what I'm doing here, though. There we go. And then from there, it will actually pick it up and actually do it. I haven't set it up to, to do any of that stuff. All right. The next thing we have is stock supplier setup. So within here, as I mentioned, you select on this. And you're brought into the stock supplier setup exactly the same as what it is within the back office. It's just that you can run it within here. The next one is auto purchase order. So by selecting on this, we're, bright, we're presented with an automated purchase order. So the system will actually automatically generate this thing on the desired date. First of all, it will, uh, this one it will apply to, and then you got to select on which particular warehouse you want it to apply to. The shipping date, okay, so I want this automated purchase order for uh, generating, let's say, of, of, as of today, or you can put in a future date for that. Now, along with this, we have include forecast up to the shipping date. So let's say, for example, in here, um, I may want, if, I, if I'm on an average losing maybe, let's say, 100 eggs a day, and the shipping date is three days away, then the system will calculate out and say, okay, so it's estimated that you're going to lose another 300 eggs per day uh, between now and then. And so it will uh, actually include that into its forecast for that. Also within here as well, future orders. So in this, because I've got 200 chicken salad sandwiches, I may have also uh, need to take into account all of the ingredients for the mayonnaise and the chicken breasts uh, for that order as well. So I have some future orders that are outstanding in the system. And so in that case, I can also identify that I want them incorporated into this calculation as well. Down here, it just tells you how it works, how the whole thing uh, calculates out all that information. And then just select on OK. Are you sure? Yes. Include forecast up to that date? Yes. In future orders? Yes. And current stock are OK. No purchase orders created. OK. So because I don't have anything going on right now. Um, and I'm okay with my one supply of eggs. So if I had put in stock items of other things and so on, then it would have taken that into account where, hey, you're low in chicken breast, you're low in mayonnaise, but I haven't put any of that into the system. The next thing over is recipe setup. Okay, now as I pointed out briefly within here, this basically does the same thing as what's within product setup, where you've got the recipe tab in there, and you can apply recipe items to your, your inventory on this. Uh, the nice thing about this one, though, is it's a little more comprehensive. You select on, for example, chicken, um, and within here, I can then identify, okay, I want uh, chicken breast and uh, one piece. And from here, it will calculate out your, your cost per unit based on your orders and so on like that. I haven't completed all that process yet. But in here, it will come up with all that stuff. And, uh, and you can say within there, and you can just kind of toggle around between all these different ones uh, to come up with these different things. Add spillage and waste. Now this is for a situation where, for example, I've dropped some eggs, for example. So I'm going to select on this, and I'm going to say Warehouse General. Okay, inventory item was egg, and in here, quantity, I spilled four eggs. Scott is clumsy. Okay, so within here, I put in this entry into the system, and by selecting on OK, then what it's done, it's actually taken that out of my inventory and it's written it off to spillage and waste. And if I was to generate a spillage and waste report, that would be showing up within there. Add batch recipe. Okay, remember Scott's potato salad. So in this, you know, I haven't really done much as far as the potato salad, but in here I've got my potato salad. I'm going to make uh, enter batch quantity. I'll say two batches, okay, which might be like six bowls or something like that. And Scott makes the salad.
And there we go. And once again, it's actually, uh, this is how you go about updating your inventory for that. So what that process does, it actually pulls out those raw ingredients from your inventory and then puts in, in place of it, uh, the batches of the potato salad added into your inventory. Right? So that's basically inventory in a nutshell. Now, along with this, um, the question may come up, well, you know, do you do LIFO and FIFO and can we integrate with other things and so on like that? Okay, do we do LIFO, FIFO? No, we do not. Do we integrate with other things? Yes, we can actually interface with uh, other um, inventory systems, some higher end systems that do a lot more than what we do. Uh, just one off the top of my head is Food Track, for example. I know we have an interface with that. If you check the certified device list within the MyPower website, you'll actually get a much better idea in terms of what systems we interface with, with regards to inventory and what all is required for that as well. Um, also, do we interface with liquor dispensing systems? Yes, we do. Do we interface with liquor weighing systems? Yes, we do as well. So all of those things can be taken into account uh, with regards to inventory uh, as well. Um, also, um, no, that's, that's pretty well it. You know, so as, in terms of inventory, it's a pretty basic system. Uh, it's just tedious. That's all in terms of being able to manage things. But all uh, all inventory systems are tedious. Um, we are also in the process of doing some uh, upgrading to, to interface with things such as eCisco, for example, for automated, like an EDI application for uh, automated uh, purchase ordering and so on like that over the internet as opposed to doing it all kind of in a manual process. We're not completed with that right now, uh, but that's one of our projects that's currently in the go is, is the automating this a little more for web-based ordering and so on like that. Okay, so I think that's pretty good for what we've got. Now, what I'm going to do at this point here, we're, gonna, we're finished with inventory, but I'm going to kind of keep on that general flow that we're in right now, and I'm going to cover another topic that is similar to it, and it's called cash management. Now, cash management is basically the inventory of cash. It's one of these systems where after the end of day has been run and all of your reports are generated and everyone's, you know, shook hands and gone home, what happens within the system? What do we do beyond that? Well, first of all, all of your money goes to the safe at the back and it resides within the safe. And we actually have a system for monitoring in terms of how much money you've got located within each one of these safes. Also, uh, what happens when the safe gets full? Well, you need to actually make a deposit into the bank and get that money into the bank. And this system is capable of doing that as well, where you can do bank deposits. So the cash management system is comprehensive in the sense that it handles everything after the POS, beyond the POS, in terms of managing safes, managing uh, petty cash, managing quantities within the safes, transfer of money within the safes. Also, um, managing your denominations as well to make sure that you've got sufficient fives and tens and twenties to make change and so on like that uh, within the establishment and also for making bank deposits to take all this this money and get it into the bank as well so that's what this does now as you can see it's broken off to three general sections again we have pull down menus across the top that cover all the different things that show up usually within the blue taskbar and then down below that we've got this thing where we've got a tree on the left hand side and then all of the corresponding selections over on the right as you select through each one of these. Now, the first thing we've got I'm going to show you here is safe. When you first go into cash management, we have general safe residing in there. And safe is basically, you know, this is the back office safe. When I have all my money at the end of the night, I put it in there. Now, depending on the nature of the establishment, you may have multiple safes and very special, there are very specialized types of safes for doing different things. Uh, for example, I may have a cashier drawer safe. So if, for example, I've got all kinds of cash, cashiers and they have the cash drawer inserts, and I need a place to keep those things because I can't keep them in the cash drawer. So uh, I have a safe with a whole rack mount system designed for this. And at the beginning of the day, I open up the safe. There's all my list of all the, the drawers. And as my cashiers come in, then I will take one out and give one to Sally and one to Wendy and one to Sue and so on like that. And then they will take those and do, um, uh, they'll do a, a deposit into, into the station, or put it into the station. And then they'll do their, their, uh, their till management from there. And then when they're done, then they'll bring it back uh, with all of their cash out reports and so on like that. And if all, everything's all balanced, balanced out, I should have the, the, the float in there of $200 within that safe again or whatever the float happens to be. 
And then from there, I put the safe back, or the, uh, the, the insert back into the safe again. So I can have a whole special safe for that. I can also have one just for the general sales as well. Uh, I can also have petty caches in the, inside these safes, and I can have uh, whole special things for, for these as well uh, that are, are set up. And so this system will allow you to do all this kind of stuff. It's just a matter of creating it all. Now, the first thing you want to do before getting into any of that, uh, first of all, go through your policies and just see what you need to do within here. And within here, we've got things like uh, cash management, for example. If there's anything in here that you may need to apply to these different things, then just kind of uh, go through and make sure those things are activated on the system as well. Uh, the same would apply to denominations and make sure you've got things set up for those as, as well. Um, also, um, maybe tender balancing, if there's anything in there that may be required for that. Now, with all that done, what you're going to find, first of all, is that when we go into payment method setup, and I'm within cash here, we've got payment denominations. And in this is where we go about setting up all of the denominations for our various forms of currency. If you have multiple forms of currency, you have to do this for each one of them. Now, in this, for example, you'll see I've got one here for $50 bills. So in this, the denomination I've set up, and it, all I have to do is just select on Add and then create all these additional ones. So for $50 bills, it is 50s. I've got a printed description as well. What type is it? Well, it's a bank note versus individual coin, small coin. Um, also, cash levels. I've got a par level, which is the desired level to bring it up to, and the reorder level. Okay, so I'll just think inventory again, reorder level, par level, the minimum and the maximum level for this. And when you're putting in your numbers, entered by amount, like this is a dollar amount, so for $50, it's $100 in 50s, bring up to $2,000 in 50s. Or I could select on number of items, in which case then I have $150 bills, bring it up to a level of $2,050 bills. So you can see there's a big discrepancy just based on how you enter it within here. But each one of these works better for some forms of denominations than others. And then having saved that, then it will be entered in down here. Let's go down to something like coin. Okay, so within here, I've got a denomination. I, for example, I just put in 0.5 general, and it's coin. And in here, I've just put in something kind of generic as well. So if you want, you can go into individual denominations right down to the cents and pennies if you want. Or you can keep it as something, something general in terms of just coin and then come up with some, some amounts uh, rather than the individual items for that and just leave it as miscellaneous coin if you want to do that. Or you can break it off into, into individual denominations like quarters, nickels, dimes, and so on as well. But it's important to have all this in here because when you're doing tender balancing, then the system will actually take a look at this and allow you within the tender balance screen to identify all right, not only what have you got for an amount of cash uh, that you're, you're submitting, but what have you got for hundreds, tens, you know, fifties, twenties, and, and fives, and so on like that. So it will actually prompt you what is the denominations for it. A button will show up for that. You select on it. It will present all of these denominations, and you put in the numbers for each one of those. When you're, when you're counting that out. And then having done that, then within cash management, you'll, uh, you'll be able to see all of that. Now, in the end of day, um, when you run a, cons a successful end of day, you will have a list of all of the different cash outs from all the employees showing up within here. And you can take a look at the individual entries for this. I apologize. I don't have my own entries in here for this because I'm working with just a, a uh, test database right now. But in this, all of the individuals, their, their cash outs will show up within here. And all of those items will have been deposited into the general safe or whatever safe you've set it up to go into. Now, how do you set these up? All right, well, first of all, let's, uh, let's create our own safe. So the first thing we're going to do is we're going to go into safe. Now, you can work with the pull-down menus on these. Or another simple way to do is just do a right click on these things. And the appropriate selections will show up automatically. So on this, I'm in the safe menu, and on this, I can prepare a bank deposit. I can uh, also create a new safe, which we'll do shortly. I can also create a petty cash. End of day summary, I can refer back to that with all of my different entries that have been into it, and also employee cash outs as well. And I can focus on individual entries that have been done with that and have them deposited into various safes and so on. And then from here, just how you want to view and its icons here or list or however you want to change it around that way. Okay, so on this, what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into safe and I'm going to create a new safe. And so in this, I'm going to say Scott's new safe. Okay, 
is this the primary safe? The primary safe being the, the primary safe for the overall money that's coming in from the establishment. Uh, you can select yes or no for this. This will identify whether it's the default one for the representing uh, the profit coming in for the establishment. Locked. Is this a lock safe, meaning that when money is put in here, the only way it can be taken out is through a bank deposit. It can't be transferred to other safes. So you can identify that. Uh, a reference number, if there's some kind of reference number you want to throw in, you can put that in there as well. Uh, who the main contact is, phone number. If there's a, a different address from the establishment, you can choose that or just copy from company info and it'll populate that for you, indicating that it resides on staff. And so there it is right there. And then from here, I can start doing some other things with it as well. So in here, we got properties that say, if you come in, there's all your information on it. We got bank deposits. Again, we, we got, haven't got to the point of doing a bank deposit yet. I'll, I'll show you that shortly. Um, also within this as well, the safe, we can edit the information on the safe. Also, we can apply a petty cash to it as well. Here, I'll, I'll just create a quick petty cash. And so in this, we'll say Scott's petty cash. And once again, you can put in a reference number for that. And when you're uh, putting money into it, there's a couple ways you can do things. You can transfer from other locations, or you can do a pay-in. Uh, so in this case, um, yeah, I'll, no, I'll just leave it as it is, because I, I don't have any information here right now. We'll just save that as it is. But now I've got a petty cash that's branching off uh, from Scott's new safe as well. All right, uh, now, when I go down to my safe, we've got a few things here. Prepare a bank deposit. Give me the balance on it. Right now I have nothing in there, so it won't show anything. But it's basically like show your, think of a safe as a warehouse. OK, so there's my, my levels within there. Transfer, transfer between warehouses. We'll transfer between safes. You can do that as well. Pay-ins, pay-outs, and also Scott's Petty Cash as well. And I don't have anything done in there. OK, so on this. Um, now what I'm going to do, I'm going to put some money into it. Okay, so I have my safe. I'm going to do a pay-in. So here we are on the pay-in screen. So for this is when I'm setting up my money, my initial money on this. So add a pay-in. We'll say initial deposit. This is um, a refund reason that I created. And in here, now I'm presented with all my denominations. And on my 50s, I've got, uh, let me see, enter the amount. Okay, so I'll say $250 in 50s. And there's my 50s added in there. And uh, then from here, add a pay in again. Initial deposit, 20s. And on here, I'll say enter amount, $220. OK, you get the idea. And so from here, I've got 50s and 20s that are on this. And then from here, I can process pay ins. So now what I've done is I've actually put money in there. And there's my balance on here. So I've got 250 and 220, I got a total of $470 in this bank, in this, uh, in this safe right now. And from there, I can transfer that to, to other safes and so on like that. Right now, from here, I'm going to do um, a, a deposit, a bank deposit. So I'm going to select on this and prepare a bank deposit. So first of all, we've got the bag that's going to go to the bank. Uh, so within here, I put in my bag reference number of whatever it's going to be. Deposit via, and within here, it looks at my various reasons that I've already created, or I can create new ones as well. So I'll say John goes to the bank. And a reference code for this specific delivery as well. All right, from here, I have my balance that's in the, the safe, and here's what's in the bag. And so from here, I'm going to uh, select over on the 50s. And then here, I'm going to say there's $150 I'm going to deposit into the bank. I'm brought it down to the 20s. And in here, I'm going to put in $80. OK, so from this, I've got $230 uh, that's going to be deposited into the bank. And from here, print two, and let's just do a preview on this. So here's now a bank deposit slip. You know, so it looks like, in, like a purchase order. Everything, you know, we kind of went with the same format for all of these things. And from here, I now have a deposit slip that will be going to the bank with all of this information. You can print that off or send it to a file as well. I can deposit now or deposit later. I'm going to say deposit later. And notice now I've got this deposit showing up within here. So it's an outstanding deposit that has not been done yet. I can always add to this as well. That's really why I'm holding off on this deposit, because I may want to add in more cash to it. When I'm ready to do it, then I can come back to it. And I can say deposit now. 
Yes. And now that money has been pulled out of the safe and and that deposit is now being sent off to the bank as well. So that is money that's been transferred from where I was to uh, where, where I'm going. And so that basically, in a really rough nutshell, is how you do cash management on the system. I think I've got actually a more detailed video of this that's available uh, on the MyPAR website. I uh, can't remember if I do or not. And uh, also, it is des described much better um, in the manual as well. So there's a whole section in there pertaining to cash management. So I recommend taking a look at that. All right, so that was cash management. And now, uh, let me see where I want to go here. Actually, I'll tell you what. No, I'm going to hold it right where I am because I think we've covered it up. Just really good topics for, for this week. So what I'm going to do at this point, Leslie, is I'm going to open it up uh, a little early for today and uh, see if there's any questions that we can cover with regards to inventory or cash management. And, uh, and we'll finish it off then. Okay. Um, as usual, if you have a question, if you can type your question into the question panel box, and I'll go ahead and read them as they come into the queue. I don't have any questions yet. Okay, I'm sure it might take <laughs> might take a minute to type some of the questions, so we'll we'll get in a couple of minutes. Nothing in the queue so far. <laughs> okay. Uh, one thing I've, I think what we might do in the future here, folks, is that if you do have a question that you, and it's going to take you time to, to type it, just type your name and then send that off as a question to Leslie so she knows that there is something that's, that's being typed out. Um, you know, so we don't sit here guessing if there is going to be questions or not. All right, I'll give about another minute for questions. If there is anything, great. If there's not, then we're done. Okay, going, going, gone. All right, so I guess we really didn't have much for questions today, um, and that was that was quite a bit, you know, a pretty heavy load to handle for today. So, but it's nice that we finished off session nine. We got inventory done and out of the way. And it's a pretty heavy topic to cover, um, and so thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen, for your time and attention, and uh, appreciate you bearing with me as I trip over my tongue a couple times. But uh, anyway, uh, it's been a lot of fun. And um, so the next sessions will be next week. And uh, they'll be the last three sessions. And within there, we're going to uh, finish off some of the heavier topics within the back end, such as Web2Go, credit authorization, stuff like that. And we're also going to get into some of the utilities available within the system as well, also what resides within the POS folder and uh, maybe some other concepts like that as well. OK, so we've got enough to certainly carry us through uh, for the next next three uh, next three sessions, so thank you very much for uh, everyone, and uh, have a good day. Bye bye.